Hi guys. Um, I don't know if you're with me. Um, it appears we he had an outage. It seems like my um, internet provider is misbehaving. Um, I think we have logged off and logged back on. I'd sure appreciate it if you'd tell me how we're doing because I, I had some fun. Ouch. Somebody says, ouch, my ears. I don't know what the problem is. Oh, Charlie says, there you are. Oh, dear. I'm, I'm, I'm getting mixed messages. Um, Zuman says, now it sounds goity. I don't know what that means. I, I, uh, oh, it sounds good. Good. Working now. On YouTube, it's where. Okay, so we're back. It's live. We're working. I don't know what happened. I, I sure appreciate coherent, clear feedback from you guys. Let me know what's going on so I can decide whether we proceed or not. I think we're okay now. Okay, sounds good. Everybody's chiming. I apologize. I don't know. You know, my software is very complicated. It's more difficult than cooking a brisket. Okay, it sounds like we're working. And what I wanted to touch upon tonight is what I love to cook for when I have company over for football, I'm a football fan. If you follow me on Twitter and social media, you know I'm a football fan. Of course, I'm a Florida Gator fan, and I'm a Bears fan. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about my Florida Gator history. I was the sports editor of the University of Florida Alligator, the campus newspaper. And when I was there in the 70s, a famous sports writer um, became known as Paper Lion, George Plimpton, who wrote for the New Yorker and many other publications, went into the boxing ring with boxers and wrote about his experience. And he tried out for the Detroit Lions. And he played for the Detroit Lions in, in, in preseason and wrote about what it's like to be in a professional football training camp. And it was fascinating reading. He's a brilliant writer. And he, he did all kinds of stuff. Jumped from airplanes. And I thought it was the coolest thing. And there I was, the sports editor, the University of Florida Alligator. And I thought, you know, I played high school football. I was pretty decent. I thought, maybe I could get the coaches at the University of Florida to let me come out for spring training. And they did. I dressed, and I had a locker, and I went out, and I practiced with the team in spring training. Now, I'd been a high school linebacker, and you know I was weighing maybe at the time 170 pounds. Eh, it's not going to cut it in the SEC as a linebacker. So they put me as a safety. And, you know, okay, I trained as safety. I'd never played the position before, but what the hell. I was there, really, to write a story. And so I trained, and they gave me the locker next to Jack Youngblood. Now, I don't know how many of you know that name, but Jack is in both the college and the NFL Hall of Fame. Played for the Rams after Florida. And he was six seven. He was a uh, he was an edge rusher, uh, a defensive man. And you know, I was five seven. He was six seven. So in huddles, he would rest his elbow on my helmet. <laughs> and I basically got my ass kicked all over the field. And came spring game, the orange and blue game. I sat on the bench with a clipboard, and I'm taking notes. And I've been writing uh, two or three columns a week about what was going on in spring training. It was pretty good writing too. And um, finally, spring game, I'm sitting there. They let me dress. I had, you know, game uniform on. And uh, last play of spring training, 
They blew the whistle, stopped the game, and Coach turned around and yelled, Paper Gator, get your hat. Well, I didn't know where the hell my helmet was. It was under the bench somewhere. Found my helmet, ran up, and he said, get in there. <laughs> so the last play of the orange and blue grain in spring training, I go running out on the field, and I get in the huddle, and the huddle breaks, and I line up at safety, and there's somebody in my position. And he says, no, man, you're middle linebacker. Well, wait a minute, I hadn't been middle linebacker all spring. But I, they sent me in. I looked up. Now, this is the Florida Gators. If you know anything about college football, this was the fun and gun Gators. Empty backfield 90% of the time. I look up. They're in an I formation. Most of the time, they ran a 5-3 defense, which meant there was a middle guard head up on the center. Now they're in a 4-3 defense, which means there's nobody head up on the center. I look up. I'm head up on the center as middle linebacker. <laughs> Behind him is the quarterback and the fullback and the running back. <laughs> I realized pretty quickly there's a bullseye on my chest. The ball is snapped and it's handed to the running back. And I just dove for the center's ankles and he fell over top of me. <laughs> and the running back fell over top of him. And my record in the swamp is one play, one tackle. For a one-yard loss. Top that. I belong in the Hall of Fame. Well, <laughs> sorry to bore you with that long story. I didn't plan to tell that tonight. But I'm a football fan, and I know a little bit about the game. And uh, I love entertaining friends for the big game. And uh, one of my best friends is a high school football coach. And uh, what, you know, everybody has all their recipes and everything Chicken wings are great, of course. Everybody loves chicken wings. They sell like crazy for uh, playoffs. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the classic wing prep is deep fried. And that gets the skin really crispy. And that's crucial because so much of the joy of chicken wings is the crispy skin and flavorful. But they're good on the grill. And you can get it crispy on the grill or in the smoker, but you've got to get it with high heat at the end in order to get them crispy. Throw them on the smoker and there's just not enough heat there to get them good and crispy most of the time. So I like to take them off the smoker and then throw them over. I put them on my gas grill as hot as I can get it and get it as crispy as I can. And I put out a, a variety of sauces, just good old barbecue sauce, an Asian hot um, sweet, sweet hot sauce is always nice. A variety of sauces, let people dunk and dip. But what my favorite thing is, and I'm going to show you some pictures, is flank steak. I, I like to do it at tailgates because I can do it on a $30 hibachi. Flank steak's marvelous. It's this section from along the underside of the steer. And it's never very thick. It's maybe at the most an inch, inch and a quarter thick on one end. A little thinner on the other end, maybe a half inch. Kind of tapers. But it's a hard-working muscle, and there's a lot of beefy flavor. And it can handle high heat. The problem is, is it's lean. There's not a lot of fat in it, so there's not a lot of flavor from fat. But there's a lot of flavor of its own. And the other thing is, is... You have to cut it across the grain. If you cut it with the grain, it's stringy. It gets stuck in your teeth. So you got to cut it across the grain. And the way I like to cook it is a, is a technique I learned. If you've followed me at all, you know it. I had a previous life in wine. Here we go. always have a bottle of wine open when I talk to you guys. Um, and... Uh, I was the wine critic for the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune for a number of years. Had a magazine about wine. And I traveled all over the world to learn about wine. And I went to Bordeaux, and I got there during harvest season. Now, in spring, the grapevines have to be pruned. They grew rapidly over the summer. And some of the growth had grapes on it. They harvested the grapes. But in winter, in the cold, they have to cut the vines back. It's called pruning. 
and I have to cut it back, and I have to be selective and cut back. So the only thing left are the new canes that have buds on them that will bear fruit this year. The old canes, the old growth from last year, that bore fruit from last year, will not bear fruit this year. So they cut all those off and stack them in a pile. And they bring in manual labor from all over Europe, France, Spain, and you know they, they harvest these grapes in the fall. And they have to feed these people. So they light these big piles of grapevines on fire. And they just go whoosh! Because most of these cuttings are no bigger than a pencil in thickness. And, you know, you get 20-foot flames. And then within 10, 15 minutes, they burn down to this little pile of glowing embers. And those embers will continue to glow for about 15 or 20 minutes. And they emit this marvelous fruit wood smoke. And they would grill off meats, particularly what we called LDBs, little dead birds, quails, and uh, little small birds. And they would grill them off, and oh my, and then people would sit around in the field at lunchtime grilling these LDBs and drinking wine, and it was a marvelous atmosphere. Mostly young people, a lot of teenagers, beautiful girls, and, you know, I came back and I wanted to replicate it. So on my small property, I planted some grapevines. And I hoped to get grapes, maybe make some wine or some raisins or something. But I'm in the Midwest in the Chicago area, and this is not great, great country. But I did get a lot of cuttings, just like they do in France. So what I did was, now I'm going to try to share a screen here. Let's see if I can do that. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, share screen. Oh, there's the button. Yeah, okay. Uh, wrong screen. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay. I don't know if that's the screen I'm sharing. Stand by. Yes. Okay. So I take these grapevine cuttings that I grow on my own property and I put them in my Weber kettle. I take all the racks and grates out and I crumple up some newspaper and put it in the bottom of the Weber kettle. And then I pile it high with these grapevines. Now, the grapes were harvested in the fall and over winter, I pruned them and I let them dry out for at least a few months so that they become kindling. Put newspaper in the bottom, reach underneath with a lighter and light them. Okay. Again, let's see if that's showing. Yep. When I light them, man, do they go up in a hurry. Um, I mean, that's incredible. Wait a second here. Let me uh, see if I can improve this image for you. Yeah. There we go. So, I light them from below, and just like in France, poof, they go up in flame, and there's a four or five foot flame. Once, I almost melted the cable TV cable, which was above. Uh, I mean, it just, and you got, you can, I don't know if you can see, but there's a railing behind there. I had to roll the thing away from the railing. But after about four or five minutes, they burn down into embers. Let's see if that shows up. Yeah. And now you can see the embers. And I put the flank stake on top of these glowing embers. And there's smoke. A grape wood is a fruit wood. Fruit woods and nut woods and other hardwoods are your best woods for grilling over because they have a nice fragrance. And they, they, they improve the flavor of the food you're cooking over. So here you can see a flank steak. And I have flipped it once. You can see it's, it's seared on one side. But it sears in a hurry. I mean, like three or four minutes. You've got to, and you've got to flip it. Otherwise, the grates will burn deep into the meat. I mean, those are grill marks that are two 
intense. So you got to flip it two or three times. Now, there's a skinny side and a fit thick side. And if that skinny side is cooking too fast, which it typically does, I'll move it and let it hang over the edge of the grill. So it's not under the influence of that heat. But the thick end is. And the whole thing, the, 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 the embers burn out within 10, 15 minutes at the most. And then there's hardly anything left. But those grapevines and that wood create a marvelous flavor. And um, the result is a really rich, now it's really kind of hard to see here, but you get a really deep, rich mahogany crust. And the meat is rare to medium rare. Medium rare is my preference. 130, 103. It's absolutely perfect. It's just effing brilliant. And it's brilliant all by itself. But if you want, and this is what I love to do for football games, it makes incredible sandwiches. You can make a chimichurri on it if you want, or put a mayo on it if you want, or just bare ass naked. And I'll tell you, it is just incredible. I, it, in, in France, the process is called sarmon, S-A-R-M-E-N-T, sarmon. And it's, uh, it means essentially cooking over grape wood. Um, in Spain, I think they call it sarmiento. Um, but it really is wonderful. Now, I do this with grape wood. But um, one of my neighbors has a cherry tree, and we tried it with... Cherry, cherry cuttings, and it worked great. So the whole idea is they're, they're no more than a, a pencil thick. Um, just load up that grill with um, thin cuttings, just like you see here. Light them on fire and move that meat through in a hurry. You cannot do a two-inch thick steak because the it burns out too fast. And you'll scorch the outside. You'll have black outside and raw center. Flank steak is perfect. If you want to try skirt steak, it'll work, I'm sure. I've never done with skirt steak. But flank steak is the perfect. And it is just more wonderful, beefy flavor in flank steak. The grapevine smoke flavor. And that high heat making a great sear. It's just outstanding. And everybody loves it. So that's what I like to do, and that's what I'm going to be doing on Super Bowl Sunday. So let's see. I, 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 we're, now that we're back up and running and the sound problem seems to be fixed, let me see what we have here in the way of questions. Um, let me turn off screen share. Here I am. I'm back. You got an ugly face here. Okay. Okay, I've got a bunch of people. Ah, Jim Morgan's doing a spiral cut ham this weekend. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. And you know, a lot of spiral hams, you know, they're pre-cooked. All you got to do is heat them to 145 and away you go. But if you put them on a smoker and you create your own um, glaze, I, I like an apricot glaze and I've got a really nice recipe that I got from Chris Lilly. Um, it's an apricot glaze. Um, you can glaze it and then you can wrap it in foil so it warms thoroughly. You can take it out and roll it around and get that glaze really crispy and caramelized. A lot of fun. Zuman Ju. Ah, his wife is a gator. You've been to Ben Hill Griffin. That's a lot of fun. The swamp. I'm hoping they, uh, they, they turn it around this year. They've had a couple of years of rough luck. Jim Morgan does wings with indirect heat on his Weber gas grill and then dry rubs them. Excellent. Yeah, uh, start them indirect and then, Jim, just, just before you're ready to serve, lift the lid and roll them over on the hot side. You've got to stand there and watch because they'll go from golden to black in a hurry. And just try a little high heat and see if that doesn't amp it up an, a, a, a degree. Hello, John. John McGuire here. Um, okay. Oh, um, Dan Mancuso. Dan, Dan, 
It's always great to see you. Dan, I think, has been at every one of these things. Um, he's been doing the Asian baby back recipe for Super Bowl. There's a recipe on our website. The first ribs I ever had. My dad was a griller, and he was pretty good. But the first ribs I ever had were at the local Chinese restaurant. I mean, when I was a kid, what a treat that was. Let's go to the Chinese restaurant. Or let's go out for pizza. Those are the two big nights, man. Pizza night, Chinese restaurant night. And God, I love those Chinese ribs. You know, they were kind of reddish, and they were sweet. They had that hoisiny sauce. I've got a couple of recipes for Chinese-style ribs on AmazingRibs.com. If you like those as much as I do, and it sounds like Dan Mancuso likes them too, go try those recipes. They're a lot of fun. And one of them actually calls for you to break them down into individual bones and cook them individually. They go real fast that way. They're a little chewier. Oh, Mark Nagy does Italian beef sandwich. 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 He spells it right. S-A-N-G-W-I-N-C-A. -S sandwich. Um, that's the uh, South, Side Chica South, South Side Chicago. Um, Italian beef is a, a, a Chicago uh, local dish. Um, thin sliced lean beef. Um, go read the recipe. If you ever watched the, the movie, the, the TV show Bear, that was an Italian beef sandwich joint. That's what they were famous for. And in fact, it was filmed at a restaurant, a real restaurant, that is famous locally for Italian beef sandwiches. So I've got the recipe. In fact, I posted it years ago, and it was number one on the uh, Google search engine for years. A um, bunch of imitators have come along and supplanted me. But it's a really good recipe, um, and uh, we, if you want to try that, da beef, says Mark, da beef. Yeah, that's it. Uh, okay. Um, Ivan is asking, ham in a pan or straight on the grate? I will take a, um, a, 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 a pre-cooked. I mean, most, most, most of your spiral sliced hams are cooked already. All you got to do is heat them to 145, which is your safe temp. And I'll take that pre-cooked ham. Don't want to salt it. Don't need to season it in any way. It's all done. All you do is warm My Most people just pop it in the oven and warm it. So you put it on the indirect side of the grill. You've got two zones, a hot side and a not hot side. If you're not familiar with the concept of two-zone cooking, please go read about it on AmazingRibs.com. You got a hot side that has a lot of infrared energy coming from below. And then you've got a not hot side, which just sits there. There's no flame or anything below it. And it's just warming with convection airflow. Put it on the indirect side and just warm it gently. 145 for a pre-cooked spiral cut ham is USDA safe. So 145, that's pretty low. Probably, you know, it's a big thick hunk of meat. So it takes an hour, an hour and a half, maybe, depending on how well you're controlling your temp. Use your digital thermometer. And along the way, if you want, you can paint it with a sweet glaze. Usually it has a glaze on it when you buy it. But you can amp it up, get a better glaze, come up with a glaze. You can use barbecue sauce. I like a fruit glaze. An apricot peach seems to be my favorite. And like I said, I have a really good apricot glaze recipe on AmazingRibs.com. And so you can just paint it while it's sitting there on the indirect side. You can put it in a pan if you want, and that will capture the drippings. But I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I want it to heat from all around on all sides, top and bottom. And uh, then when it's just about done, I'll move it over to the direct side a little bit and just kind of caramelize the sugars. There's sugar in most of these sweet um, glazes. And at a certain temperature, usually in the 300s, the sugar will caramelize. And that changes the chemistry of the sugar and creates caramel. And as you know, caramel is a very complex. Think about it. A spoonful of granulated sugar. It's really sweet, but it has no flavor. But if you take that sugar and put it in a pan and heat it, like take a cup of sugar, put it in a pan and heat it, Believe it or not, it will melt and it will become liquid. 
and then it will start to turn yellow and golden, and that's caramelization, and that's how they make caramel. And caramel has flavor, sugar doesn't. It's both sweet and flavorful. So if you put a sweet sauce that has sugar in it over direct heat, depending on the kind of sugar involved, is it sucrose or glucose? And I talk a lot about this on AmazingRibs.com and in my book, in my book, um, you can get it to caramelize and it changes the flavors and amps it up. So I'll start it indirect, get it almost done, roll it on the direct heat side, give it some uh, punch from the direct heat, and that caramelizes the sugars. Off it comes, slice it up, and away you go. And I'm pretty sure the website has some really good slicing instructions because it's a pain in the butt to slice a ham because you've got uh, two bones, essentially, coming in there. It's an elbow or a knee, if you will, um, and it comes in and it bends, and there's a trick to slicing it. And I show you, there's an illustration that shows you how to slice it. And then you slice down into the bone and you stop. Now it's not coming off. It's just still hanging on the bone because you sliced down into the bone. Then you start at the top of the bone and you slice across and thoop, 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 they all fall off. And that's the way to do it. So go see that. Okay. Chicago says, Bravo, man. yeah, yeah. Uh, my gators and my bears. This is this is this year. This year, the gators got the number one ranked quarterback in the country this year. So, and they still have their quarterback from last year, who was really good. Um, so, uh, we'll see. We'll see how they do. Okay. So, what are you guys doing for uh, Super Bowl? I don't see any women here. Where's where's all our girls? Barbecue is still a boys' club, isn't it? I don't know how to do that, fix this. I don't know how to break this. We do have a lot of women in our pitmaster club. I'll say that, and they're good. They know how to cook, and they're into it. It's not like they're afraid. Oh, I don't know I want smoke in my hair. No, they're good. But uh, geez, you know, there's not a female out in the audience tonight that I can see. I don't see everybody. I only see those of you who are commenting. But um, Jim Morgan's doing ribs on the pit barrel. Pit barrel smoker. Hey, you guys, you know, a lot of people buy these offset smokers. They're a horizontal tube, and then there's this box that kind of hangs off the edge, and you put the wood or the charcoal in it, and you go down and you buy them at Home Depot or Lowe's, and you get them for like 200, 300 bucks, and they're garbage. They're a pain in the neck to manage. They're really hard to control the heat, but they look macho. They look like a real. If you want to look macho and you don't want to spend a lot of money, buy a barrel. The pit barrel smoker, it's like a, a drum. It's like a 35 gallon drum is the basic unit. They have a bigger one and a smaller one. But it's like a drum. It sits vertical. It's not horizontal. And they really work well. And they look macho. So if you want to look macho, you get one of these barrels. They work so much better than these cheap Home Depot offset smokers. Go check them out. Pit Barrel Smoker is one of my favorites. They were among the very first to come out with a commercial unit. Um, uh, Big Papa Smoker has one that you can kind of cobble together yourself. You get um, a, a, a steel drum, and then you outfit it yourself with their kit. Um, there's a bunch of other companies now making barrel smokers that are kind of elaborate and clever, but they're more expensive. Pit Barrel's great. I love them. Strongly recommend them. Take a look at those. They're really good smokers, uh, and you can rig them up for grilling, but they're not designed for grilling. They're designed for smoking. They don't take up a lot of space either because they're a drum. You know, they're small. They got wheels and stuff under them. Okay. Zumanju. How's this idea? Since salting ground beef when mixing for burgers makes the burger tougher. Yes, you're right. When you're making burgers, don't mix salt into the grind. 
wait until it's all compacted and into your um, patty, then salt the outside just before cooking. If you mix salt in there, it denatures the proteins and it can make them tough. And Zumanju knows this, that's what he's saying. Why not salt the meat in advance, dry brine, and then grind the meat and shape it so it's not tough? Good concept, interesting concept. Might work, um, especially if you're grinding it yourself. I'm a little concerned that once you salt it in advance, that salt's going to migrate deep into the meat. Then you grind it, and it's still down there doing its thing, which is denaturing the proteins. And it's going I I think, frankly, I would prefer. Now, I'm at best of all worlds for a burger, a great burger. I've been fiddling with my burger techniques, by the way. Uh, let me let me take you through my latest burger technique. All right, there's there's basically two types of burger. There's the diner burger, which is four ounces or so, and from those, most of them are flattened on a flat top, and they're smashed burger types. And if you're gonna do one of those, try the. Oklahoma onion burger style, which is basically three to four ounces of ground meat. You make you make a, a ball and you slap it on a flat top. Now you can do it in a frying pan. You can do it on a, uh, a lodge griddle on your gas grill or your charcoal grill. Or you can get a griddle, a standalone flat top griddle with three burners. But you slap this three to four ounce ball of ground meat on the griddle and you let it sit there for a minute and warm because that changes its chemistry salt it on the outside not the inside and then you take a handful of thinly sliced onion a pretty good hunk of it and lay it on top and get a big stiff spatula or the bottom of a frying pan and smash it and that's your smash burger smash it as flat as you can get it Squeeze it out as big as it'll go and really work the edges. Get the edges in close contact with the hot metal and just leave it alone. Leave it alone for five, six minutes. You can peek underneath to see if it's golden or dark brown, but you want to wait and you want to... Something just changed on my screen. Am I still with you guys? Hey, um, my screen just did something funny. Would somebody just... Uh, tell me if I'm still live. Stick, somebody please log in and say if we're still live here. I'd like to continue this burger story, but I won't, don't want to if we're not still live. Okay. Charlie says I'm still live. Thanks, Charlie. Okay. So, you smash a flat, get those edges in close contact with the hot surface. And when it starts to get really brown, not, not golden, brown, you flip it so that it, now the onions are underneath and you smash it again. And the onions caramelize underneath the burger meat. Now, it's not going to brown the burger too much on that underside. But once that underside is cooked, you slip it onto a bun. And uh, now a lot of people like to put a slice of cheese on there or some pickles, um, or even some mustard. Thank you. Everybody's chiming in. We're still live. Thank you. It's just dynamite. I tell you, this is just a really great burger. Now, the other type of burger is if you want to do what I call a, um, uh, 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 what do you call them? Uh, a thick, a, a, a thicker burger, um, a steakhouse burger is the word I'm looking for. A steakhouse, style, six to eight ounces. These three to four ounces are little flat smash burgers. I like to do the six to eight ounce burgers on a grill, not a griddle. I like them over open flame. And one of the tricks I have learned, and this goes against everything the books tell you, everything everybody's tell, tell, told you. You want to not go with the standard 80-20 blend, which is 80% lean meat and 20% fat. That's your standard burger blend when you buy it in the store, or even if you make it yourself. 
ask the butcher to give you a 70-30 blend or just buy a chuck steak, which tends to be about 80-20, and ask the butcher to give you some extra beef fat and grind it in. The whole idea here is, you see, is there's many sources, so sources for moisture in a burger. And of course, water, juice, is an important one. But melted fat is just as important. And if you've got more fat in that burger, it can be very juicy and you can cook it to a safe temperature, which USDA and everybody else says is 155. And frankly, I don't think you want to fudge too much on that. You do not want to get sick from E. coli, and you certainly don't want your kids and grandma to get sick from it. They're particularly vulnerable. So you want to cook that burger to 150, 155 to be safe, and that'll dry it out. But if you go 70, 30 instead of 80, 20, it won't be dry. That extra bit of fat will keep it moist. And you ready for this? When you throw it on the grill grates, and you flip it, smash it. Now, everybody says, don't do that, because it's going to dry it out. But you've got that extra fat in there. And when you smash it with your spatula, you'll see, and you've seen it, the juices come out, and they hit those hot coals or the gas burners, and they flare up. <coughs> What's happening is, is they're vaporizing and they come back up and they flavor that burger and they improve the flavor. It's a distinctive characteristic that you only get when you smash the burger onto the flame. Now, there's always a touchy line you walk between getting uh, soot on your burger and the, and the can. But if you fiddle with this, you're going to get an awesome burger. Go for a 70-30 blend, six to eight ounces, over the grill. Cook one side until it starts to firm up a little. And then smash it, flip it, cook till it starts to firm up a little. Smash it some more. Get that vaporized fat. And the seasonings. You've put, you put seasoning. By the way. I, you know, if you've come to these things, you know I don't advertise and promote. But if you come to these things, you know I've said this before. For years, all my life, I'm 74. I have never put anything but salt and pepper on my steaks or my burgers. This thing, we were trying to make money. We came up with a recipe for a, a red meat rub. So he came up with a recipe, and I, you know, I worked with my team, and it was basic. God Almighty, this is good on a steak. My wife and I won't cook a steak without it anymore. And that flank steak that I showed you, and my burgers, oh my, this stuff is really good. It's on Amazon, I think. Um, if you can't, don't know where to find, it, just go to amazingribs.com, and you'll find a link to it. Um, it's really good stuff. So, um, that's my, uh, my heresy to burgers, is smash them. Zumanju says his mix is always 70-30, yeah. 70-30, let her rip, mouth-watering. Oh, Dan, uh, Dan Mancuso, about, he, you've used the red meat, you think it's... Awesome, cool. Thank you for the endorsement, Dan. I'll send your check in the mail. So I'm heading tomorrow down to San Antonio. Or is it San Antone? How do you pronounce it? San Antone? I'm going to San Antonio tomorrow because the National Barbecue Association Conference started today. I love going to that conference. It's a really good conference. It tends to be mostly barbecue restaurateurs and caterers and competition cooks not a lot of consumers but there's a lot of really good information and friday i'm giving a presentation on food photography i don't know how many of you know i actually did my master's in photography 
And I did all the photography in my last book. And this book, I've really amped up the quality of the photographs. Um, I turn in the manuscript on March 1st, and um, it won't be out for a year after that, spring 70. But it's really going to happen. I know I've been teasing you guys for years. I just put a lot of effort in everything I do, and this book has just been an ordeal. Because, first of all, it couldn't be a repeat of the last book. And second of all, it has to be well, well written and well edited. And, you know, I don't want the editors monkeying with it. I want it my words. And I take pride in my words. I did my, I did my undergraduate work in journalism and my master's in photography. So it's right there, you know. And in any case, the photographs in this book are gorgeous. And I'm going to be doing a seminar on Friday on food photography at the conference. And if you're down in the San Antonio area, you can actually buy one day ticket. But they have a Saturday event, and I think it's either free or cheap. I don't know. I can't be there. I got to fly back on Saturday so I can, because my March 1st deadline is like one month away. Uh, death hovering over me. So I'm coming back Saturday. I'm not going to be there Saturday, but it's a consumer facing event. So they got a whole bunch of seminars and tastings and other things. Go to nationalbarbecueassociation.com or, or just NBBQA. Go to their website and read up on what they're doing on Saturday. And if you can, if you're in that area, go on Saturday. Um, and uh, it should be pretty cool. Um, should be good. I wish I was there. Um, next year, I'll be there for the whole conference. Bob Almond says, Amazing Ribs is his Bible. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. The book, by the way, has now become the number two best-selling barbecue book in history. 250,000 copies. Most cookbooks are lucky to do 10 to 20,000 copies. 250,000 copies. The number one. Can you guess? I won't. Uh, we'll let a couple of you guess. But uh, the, the number two barbecue book in history. Okay, what are questions, comments? Uh, Ivan Cross says he has the book and it's his go-to. Any video or Zoom of your presentation possible? I might, Mark. Mark Nagy's asking. Um, I do a number of presentations and I have, I've, some have been recorded. It's a PowerPoint, so I could easily do it. I probably will, Mark. I probably will. There is a page on AmazingRibs.com devoted to food photography, but it's not as deep and rich as what I'm going to be doing on Friday. So, uh, yes, Johnny Mags. Hey, Johnny, how you doing? <laughs> yes, you got it, Johnny Mags. Barbecue Bible by Stephen Reichlin is the number one best-selling barbecue book. Came out in the 90s. My book came in 2016. So he's got 10 years head start on me. But I'm, I'm gaining on him. No, his book is marvelous. And it was a groundbreaking book. It was one of the first great barbecue books. Yep, Mark got it too. The, Mar the Barbecue Bible. Stephen Reichlin's book. Uh, number one bestseller. But I'm right behind him. I don't know how many copies he sold. He's not going to say. Johnny Maggs uh, is here tonight. Johnny runs a, uh, a, 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 a podcast. Johnny, you'll forgive my weak memory. I'm I'm getting old and I struggle for names. What is the name of your podcast again? Because I'm going to be a guest on your podcast soon, um, and uh, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Uh oh, what did I just do? Nothing. Whew. Scared me. Yeah, Jim says he did a book. on Reichlin has done like eight or ten books. Um, and, and they're all marvelous except for one. And that is the... Um, uh, the... <laughs> uh, uh, the... The chicken with the beer can up the butt book. He did a beer can chicken book. Ah, Johnny Maggs, Pit Life Barbecue. Uh, go Google Pit Life Barbecue. 
It's a, a pretty good podcast on uh, barbecue. And uh, Johnny is uh, a, a bit of a celebrity in the barbecue world. And uh, I just sent him a copy of my book. And uh, I'm going to be a guest on his pit, pit cast, po- podcast soon. Yeah, Frank. Um, Frank Olson. GE is selling that indoor smoker now. It's a countertop appliance. Would love to read a review someday so I don't waste my money. Yeah, Max Good is our full-time grill and smoker tester. He saw it at the, um, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas where they debuted it uh, two weeks ago. And uh, he wrote a preliminary review. If you go to AmazingRibs.com and go to the grill and smoker reviews section, You'll see his observations, but he observed it from a trade show in a booth. And we pride ourselves on hands-on, try-to-break-it type reviews. And Max is waiting for them to send one. We're expecting it any day. It doesn't happen overnight. I know a lot of people get the latest, greatest, coolest smokers. And they fire it up once and they write 500-word review. And we've seen this before, and we've seen how worthless they are because they often miss problems, features. So hang in there, Frank. Watch for our review. It may be a month or more before Matt. He probably won't get it in his hands for another week or two. And then he's going to work on it for a couple of weeks. And it's winter, so fortunately he'll do it indoors. But it's a cool concept. It looks like a pellet smoker indoors. It has a good way to filter out the smoke out of the kitchen. And you better have a good exhaust system. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Uh, A a nice indoor smoker would be a lot of fun. Um, You know? I have some thoughts about it, but I'm not going to share them because I want to wait and see what Max says. He is the final arbiter. You know, Max works for us. He's the only man in the world whose full-time job is to test grills and smokers. That's what he does. I mean, look, you know, we pay him to do this. We also pay an electrical engineer to test and review thermometers. And then the rest of our team tests and reviews other gadgets. Oh, um, I just got done writing a review on a gadget that I got to share with you. It's it's called um, Grill Rescue. Let me see how they may have a photo of it. Yeah, there it is. Let me get that up. Um, All right. Let's see if I can do another screen share. Okay, that's not quite what I was trying to do. Let's see. There it is. It's coming in. It, it, can you guys see this? Uh, this uh, software here. <laughs> Ignore that face in the background. All right, I'm going to get this right. Uh, well, there it is, off to the right. What it is, it's a plastic handle with a metal scraper, and it's got a sponge in there, but it's wrapped with really heavy-duty, um, it's the stuff they make f- um, fire hoses out of. And you you dunk the thing in water. It's The sponge and the wrapping soak up the water, and you wipe down your grill grates with it. And it's really effective. It steams off a lot of the grease and junk. You scrape it first, then you wipe it. It turns black pretty quickly. But you can throw it in the washer or in the dishwasher. I wouldn't do that. I just throw it in the sink with some soap, scrub it. Never comes perfectly clean. But you can buy replacements for it. But the thing is, is it really works. It's really an effective um, grill brush. 
and it really does a great job. What's this? Look at that. Here we go. Man, I got to learn this software. There it is. That's better looking than me anyhow. There you go. It really works. Um, it um, uh, It's now my favorite grill brush. And, you know, probably you have read about the risks of wire bristle grill brushes. If you've got a wire bristle grill brush, some of those bristles can come loose. And they land on the cooking surface. And then they get on your hamburger or your steak. And somebody eats it. And it sticks in their throat or their stomach. It can kill you. Um, but it can certainly send you to the hospital. And a lot of, there's a lot of real life cases of people who got really damaged by these grill bristles. So if you're going to use a wire bristle brush, number one, the bristles must be anchored solidly into a plastic or a metal base. They can't be loose enough that they'll break loose. In a wooden base, they often come loose, and I've had that happen. Number two, after you're done scraping your grates, look at them and see if there's a bristle that's been left behind, or take a pair of tongs and a paper towel and get the towel wet and just wipe the surface to get any bristle. It's really a risk. It's a low risk, but you don't want any bristles left behind. But this, this device, Grill Rescue, it's on Amazon. Um, not expensive. I love it. <laughs> Mark Nagy says, I'll buy a countertop smoker when it comes with all my barbecue buddies allowed to hang out in my wife's kitchen for the whole weekend. Yeah, yeah. And that, and that, and that, that, that is the weirdest thing. You know, you have a you have a weekend cookout and you start the grill and what happens? All the guys hang out at the grill. And they all hang around and they tell you, it's time to flip that, isn't it? Don't you think you should flip that? Or uh, um, I think you're running too hot over here. Why don't you try a two-zone setup? You should close the lid. Have you tried using wood chips? I <laughs> It's just a stare. The whole, the whole psych, psychology of guys around the grill. It's weird. Um, uh, er, I've been, what about a fireside chat on food photography? Actually, I toyed with that tonight, although we promoted this as being sort of a pre-Super Bowl thing. But since I've done this really elaborate presentation for Friday, it crossed my mind. And yes, I think I will do um, a, 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 a fireside chat. Remember, they're every last Wednesday of the month. Um, and uh, I'll do one coming soon on food photography because I'm a re... Oh, my. I've done some gorgeous work for the... You know, I don't like to brag, but the photography for my next book is... It, it's pretty darn good, I must say. Yeah, Jim Morgan says he likes to wipe down with wet paper towels. And uh, Bob Allman says he uh, crumpled up aluminum foil. A crumpled up aluminum foil is a really good grate cleaner. Yes, sirree. Well, it's going on one hour. And normally I do an hour and a half. But I have an early flight to San Antonio tomorrow. And I am packed, though. That, that Usually I, that waits to the last minute. I think I packed everything. I, you know, I, I actually had to buy a remote clicker for my PowerPoint and have Amazon ship it to the hotel. I bought it today because I can't find mine. But in any case, uh, I think I'm ready for this. And uh, so I'm out of here tomorrow morning. I'll be back uh, over the weekend. Um, but um, I should probably get organized and get ready to call it a night, although I still have a bit of my... I'm drinking, it's cold, it's winter, so I'm drinking Fonseca Ports. Oh gosh, the, you know, um, we don't talk much about wine around here, but some of you know I was the wine critic for the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune for years, and I published a magazine about wine. So I was a wino before I was a barbecue guy. 
And uh, some of these late bottled vintage or aged tawnies are really good. Vintage port is fabulous, but it's really expensive. And if you buy it now, it's way too young. Then you've got to wait 30 years. But these late bottled vintage, oh no, don't tell me. Jim Morgan says I was, fr oh, okay. Said the screen was frozen. You know, oh God. Wake me when the internet works. God, you know, I make my living on the internet. And the goddamn thing doesn't work. Hey, at least I don't have to get up like Mark uh, Zuckerberg and apologize for corrupting your children. Jim Morgan, you're in the Finger Lakes. Did you know I lived in Ithaca for 19 years and I used to go to the Finger Lakes all the time? I was on the first judging panel at the New York State uh, uh, Wine Competition. And that first year, it was back in 76, I think, there were only four vinifera wines, four Rieslings, Wagner, Heron Hill, um, Constantine Franck, and one other. And I could see it happening. And boy, has that, has that really changed. A lot of people don't know this, but upstate New York is really great Riesling country. It's very similar to the Rheingau of Germany. And uh, there's actually some nice Cabernet Francs and Merlots coming out of there. Uh, Cabernet, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc. I've, ha I've, I've actually had a couple of Pinots. Uh, winery blew me away with a Pinot one year. I went back and bought it the next year. It was awful. So it's, you know, a really rough climate, cold climate. Um, but uh, worth paying attention to. So where are you in the Finger Lakes, Jim? <laughs> I mean, it's early for port, isn't it? What are you talking about, dude? I don't know where you are. It's 8.30 in my time. And it's the middle of friggin' January. All the snow has finally melted off where I live. But we had uh, quite a bit. Oh, you're in Syracuse. I used to get, I lived in Ithaca. I went up to Syracuse often. Um, trying to think of some of the restaurants I went to up there. Drawing a blank. But uh, a couple of good restaurants up that way. I remember I, I taught at Cornell for a while. <laughs> I remember going to Cornell Syracuse basketball games. In those days, Syracuse was a huge dominant basketball power power oh dinosaur yeah dinosaur barbecue is right up your, your way yeah they started there i think they got four or five uh, restaurants around the country now yeah dinosaur barbecue started in syracuse pascal's um i was thinking of restaurant pa okay you know if you guys show up for these things you got to put up with my law my memory and my stories i went to pascal's it was an upscale italian restaurant i don't know if it's still there let me know if it is, Jim. Um, and uh, Chuck Pascal was a friend. And uh, I go there, and we have a marvelous meal. And after dinner, the dessert cart rolls up. And the guy rolls up, and it's... Um, I, the, 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 the Bananas Foster is what he's purveying that night. Bananas Foster is a classic banana dish with a flambe. You pour um, uh, brandy over it, and you light it on fire, and there's ice cream and all kinds of fun stuff. And everybody has a different way of doing it. And he rolled up the cart, and I got to love waiters who are showmen. And he's a real showman. and he's Because this is stuff is flambéed right at, oh, it's still there, right at table side. And so he's mix, 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 and getting it together. And he finally reaches underneath the cart and pulls out, you know, the brandy and pours it over um, the bananas foster. And then he reaches under and pulls out Grand Marnier. And he says, and of course, no dessert is complete without Grand Marnier. And he pulls the cork off and puts it in his mouth and drinks a big old slug.
Pascal, tell him I said hello. I just got a message that there's audio issues again with my software. I hope you can still hear me. I'm afraid I'm wasting my breath. Well, it's been an hour anyhow. Um, and I don't know if you guys can hear me anymore. But I'm going to say thank you very much for joining me and letting me ramble on and shoot the breeze and answer your questions. And uh, I'm going to call it a night since I've got to get up early and catch a plane. No sound on YouTube. Okay. No, oh, Christ. Ah, Zumanju says I'm back again. All right, I was saying, guys, I, I don't know what the issue is. My sound checked out, and it's back. Um, I mean, you know, you never know. It could be my software. It could be my computer. It could be my Internet supplier. It could be YouTube. It could be Facebook. Who knows? I'm going to say thank you very much for giving me your attention tonight and letting me ramble on and tell football stories and restaurant stories and uh, good night and, and say good night so I can get up early and catch a flight. And uh, we'll see you again next month. And uh, bring your questions, bring your friends. Go check out amazingribs.com. There's a lot of good info, info there. If you haven't bought the book, you really ought to. It's a really good book. I put my heart into it, and there's a lot of good info in there, and I think it can up your game. So um, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm going to say good night for now. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for staying awake, and please visit AmazingRibs.com for the articles, recipes, and reviews mentioned in this chat with the Barbecue Whisperer and Hedonism Evangelist from AmazingRibs.com, the planet's biggest and baddest barbecue and grilling website, Meathead.